Greetings, and I'd like to take this opportunity to um, welcome you to the Black History Month um, at, FI, at the Fashion Institute of Technology. At this moment, now we're going to play the Black National Anthem. At this moment, I'd like to uh, introduce the president of the Fashion Institute of Technology, 
Dr. Joyce F. Brown. Good morning, Dr. Brown. Good morning. Good morning. Um, and welcome to Black History Month at FIT. You know, FIT is marking this occasion with a wide array of events that will give a snapshot of Black life in America today. It's a story of struggle, of courage, hope, and extraordinary achievement, made all the more extraordinary when told through the lens of what President Biden recently called the long shadows of slavery, of Jim Crow, of redlining, and the blight of systemic racism that still diminishes our nation today. So our emphasis this year in keeping with the month's national theme is black health and wellness. And in a few moments, we will hear from one of the country's leading experts whose evidence-based research addresses the root causes of health inequities and points as well to potential solutions. In our own community here at FIT, we too are addressing inequities with the recent launch of the Social Justice Center at FIT. Working together with a growing group of committed industry partners, we expect to advance the careers of talented members of the BIPOC community, that is black, indigenous, and people of color throughout the entirety of their education and career life cycle with a seamless pathway from early education to college programming and then to professional development. I believe the center will make meaningful change and we are going to work very hard to make sure it fulfills its promise. But that's only the start and it only touches those within our reach. You know, this nation was founded on the premise of equality for all, but to get there, we really should remind ourselves of the admonition of President Barack Obama, who said change will not come if we wait for some other person or if we wait for some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for, and we are the change that we seek. So now I am pleased to turn the program over to Dr. Ron Milan, the chair of the college's diversity collaborative and our chief diversity officer. So Ron. Dr. Brown, thank you so very much. And it's my pleasure to be here again. My name is Dr. Ron Milan, and I am the Chief Diversity Officer at the Fashion Institute of Technology. And it gives me great pleasure to uh, be with you this morning. I would like to also take this opportunity to formally welcome to the series of events that we have for Black History Month 2022. As Dr. Brown mentioned, this year's theme is health and wellness. And given the past two years, over two years, statistics show that the black and brown community suffered and continues to suffer in this pandemic. The current COVID crisis is part of a larger issue in the country related to the racial, to, uh, racial divide and social injustices. That is part of our, unfortunately, our part of our fabric. But today we, we have the pleasure of having as our keynote Dr. Julia um, Asher, and Dr. Julia Asher is the executive director of New York Presbyterian um, Dalio Center for Health Justice, and this this center is focused on health justice in in our community, the Black and Brown community, and it is her work and her research that addresses the longstanding health disparities due to race, social economic differences and limited access to care and other complex factors that impact the well-being of our, of our communities in New York and in the country. This center was established in 2020, and it works collaboratively with the New York Presbyterian Hospital, Cornell Medical Center, and, and other centers in the New York City area. And I just want to say real quick, you know, when we, when we try to reach out for speakers and, and we meet, we, we, we find sometimes we find just wonderful people and finding Julia was just an unbelievable bl a blessing because she has been on the front lines during COVID and continues to work on the front line in improving the health and wellness of the of the um, black and brown community. And so it's, she brings more than a decade of experience. She's a dedicated internist and she is just a wonderful researcher who really cares about the profession of health and wellness. And so at this point now, I would like to give the floor to my friend, 
Dr. Julia as a share. Thank you so much and good morning to everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Julia Iyashura. I'm the executive director of the Dalio Center for Health Justice at New York Presbyterian Hospital. And I am, as, as you've already known, a practicing internal medicine physician. I'd like to say a special thank you to Dr. Brown and to Dr. Mylon for inviting me today to help honor Black History Month. Um, Black History Month actually originated in the 1910s. Historian Carter G. Woodson and Minister Jesse E. Moreland, who originally founded the ASNLH, which is now actually the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. This is an association dedicated to the research and promotion of achievements by Black Americans. So they chose the second week of February as it coincided with the birthdays of two very prominent figures in history. First, Abraham Lincoln, and the second, Frederick Douglass. But Black History Month as we know it was officially recognized by Gerald Ford, former president, in 1976. At the time, he really called upon the public to seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of Black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. Black history is our history. It's American history. And the accomplishments and achievements of Black Americans throughout this history deserve recognition and spotlight during more than just the month of February. But for me, it's not only about reflection. It's not only about honoring the achievements of those that have come before us. It's about the promise of the future, about dedicated action to dismantle the systems of disadvantage and discrimination. And it's about safeguarding this month's theme, which is black health and wellness. So today I'll share with you a little bit about the work of the Dalio Center. I will highlight some of the growing challenges in health and healthcare today, trends that we see locally and nationally ones that have unfortunately persisted for decades and really serve as a call to action for all of us in every industry, for us to think about what we can do to make a difference, what we can do to truly achieve the health and well-being that every one of us deserves. So as Dr. Mylon mentioned, the Dalio Center for Health Justice was founded in October 2020 with an incredibly generous grant from Ray and Barbara Dalio and Dalio Philanthropies. Our founding mission, which we recently had the privilege to reaffirm at our one year anniversary, is to be a leader in the identification and the elimination of health inequity but with a focus on the structural and the systemic factors that lead to the conditions for poor health. So a question that we are frequently asked is why choose health justice? What's the difference between health justice and health equity? You know, as the daughter of two English professors, I more than most know that words have meaning, both in their literal meaning as well as their figurative, figurative symbolism. So to explain, picture, a, picture three people of various heights attempting to look over a fence. One person can see freely a completely unobstructed view. The second is just a bit too short to see over comfortably, but can barely peer over while standing on her tiptoes. But our third person really sees only the fence as it towers over their head. How do we fix this? Well, equality or treating everyone equally would be giving each of these three people the same size box to stand on, regardless of their initial view. 
regardless of their height. So now our first friend has an even better view. Our second can see standing on her feet, firmly planted. But unfortunately still, our third sees only the grain of the wood. The box is not tall enough to support them. Well, to achieve equity, we think instead about the outcomes and equalizing the outcomes, not the interventions. We understand that each person brings with them different risks, different lived experiences, different heights. In this scenario, we customize the boxes that we give each of our three. And now each has a view beyond the fence. But this is an important question. What if the fence weren't there at all? What if it were never there? What if the structural barriers could be broken down? Well, this is justice. When seeing over the fence, or in real terms, how we think about it in the center, achieving your optimal health becomes a right and not a privilege. And this is why we chose the term health justice rather than health equity. Equity is, is and always will be central to our work and our mission. But we wanted to focus on the structures and the systems. We wanted to focus on the fences. As one of the largest academic health care systems in the country, we can and should be occasionally provocative in our language. We want to help advance the dialogue around the structural barriers, exposing the continued influence of systemic racism and unconscious bias on overall health outcomes. We want to highlight the importance of the social determinants of health. But before we go further, I want to spend a minute on how we think about health first. And to do this, I'm going to share a few slides, but more importantly, I'm going to ask you all to take a short trip with me. <clears throat> so to orient you, here is a mortality map of New York City. And I have taken the liberty of highlighting my home neighborhood uh, on the Upper West Side, as well as an area in central Brooklyn. This is Brownsville. Now, if I take the train from my house in the Upper West Side for about an hour on the three, my life expectancy can decrease by almost 20 years, from nearly 90 to a little over 70. And that's in that one hour on the train. That's one year for every three minutes. I'm always astounded when I think about that. And I'd like to just take a minute to let that percolate, let that resonate. I think sometimes the statistics become so jarring that we no longer process them. So pause just for a moment. That is two years for every mile. And there are similar differences within neighborhoods all across the United States. But the question we should ask and the question we do ask is what's driving all of these differences? Well, we know that it's more than just life expectancy that's different in these two areas. There are differences in median household income, there are differences in educational attainment. There are stark differences in childhood poverty and the number of people that are severely rent burdened, as well as those that are housing insecure. And these are the influential factors that are the social determinants of our health. As the CDC defines them, they are the conditions in which people are born they grow, they live, they work, and they age. And my goal in the Dalio Center is to help people thrive. 
So in addition to healthcare, which actually only comprises about 20% of what it means for someone to achieve their optimal health. I think that's generally surprising to people because they think about health as inextricably linked to healthcare, and it is, but it's only one piece of the puzzle. These all are the factors that drive overall health outcomes. So I've shown you a few maps and I've shown you some data about those two areas. But what's the literature behind this? What's the research? What's the data to show that these things are linked together? Well, a lot of people have studied this. I'll highlight just a few of those studies here, but this is really a rich literature to look at that, to look at this. And we know that there are links between the social determinants of health and both short and long-term health outcomes. Here, we see that with increasing levels of education, life expectancy increases. So on the x-axis, we have years of education, and on the y, we have the odds of death. And there's a big jump with a high school degree. The same holds true with increasing levels of education, so with college and graduate degrees. When we look at healthcare access, this is something of an older study, this is in the 90s, which looked at those that have insurance, and in this case I'm using insurance as a proxy for healthcare access. It shows that those that are insured have a 25%, those, sorry, those that are uninsured have a 25% higher risk of death. 25%. Looking at the neighborhood and housing conditions, looking at the where the, and the why and the how that people live. This is a more recent study. This is looking at the effects of COVID. And there's two graphs here, which I'll explain. The first is looking at the incidence of COVID-19. And the second is looking at the mortality of COVID-19. And plotted on the x-axis is different quartiles of housing conditions. So the take home from these two, these two graphs really shows you that with poorer housing conditions, not only does the incidence of COVID-19 increase, but the mortality associated to COVID-19 increases. These studies also show that with increasing levels of income, your mortality decreases and your overall expected life expectancy at birth increases. One interesting study, and this is really starting to get at some of the drivers of the social factors, some of the influence of systemic racism on overall uh, life expectancy and mortality. So these are the differences between black and white mortality. Um, this is expected at your expected mortality at, um, at birth. And we see that the only time in which the black age adjusted mortality was the same as white was in 1918. You may know that in 1918 was the Spanish flu. But every other year, we see that there is a, a large and now unfortunately widening gap between overall expected life expectancy for black and white Americans in the United States. Further studies have looked at well, if we control for as many factors as possible, if we control for education level, because I showed you earlier that education has an influence on overall life expectancy, if we control for financial security, if we control for your housing conditions, does your life expectancy, does this gap close? And what we see is that the gap is still there. It's a little bit smaller between black and white Americans, but it is persistent. And this is where we start to uncover the root effects of systemic racism, not only as influencers of the social determinants of health, but as a determinant of health on its own. So we've learned and understood the effects of the social determinants of health for years. But for many, the COVID-19 pandemic really brought them into quite stark focus. Although I am now helping to build a center for health justice, I am first and foremost a doctor. 
During the early months of the pandemic, I was alongside my colleagues in the hospital. And although initially it was hard to make heads or tails of what was occurring, one thing was quite clear to all of us. Those being hospitalized with severe disease disproportionately from the black or brown community. And multiple population health studies have subsequently provided evidence and hypotheses for these phenomena. But frankly speaking, not many people who understood the effects of the social determinants of health and the overwhelming impact of systemic racism on the social determinants of health were surprised. The pandemic really magnified what was already occurring, adding additional and deadly risk for already marginalized communities with significant pre-existing health inequities. And I cannot undersell the magnitude of these inequities. For the first time in decades, the life expectancy at birth in the United States has declined for everyone. But as you can see here, it has declined for two or three years for black and brown populations. But before we can really understand how all of this interacts and understand what is happening now, we have to take a step back into history. We have to explore a little bit of how we got here. We really need to unearth the system that is explicitly and implicitly running in the background. So I've studied science all of my life. I'm definitely not a historian, so I promise this foray into history will be brief, but important. It's important that we understand the socioeconomic context which gave birth to many of the problems that we see today as well as the durable nature of public and private policy. These are the influencers to these health factors that drive overall health outcomes. It is important that we understand how we can pull these levers, how they have been pulled in the past, and how we need to leverage this to be able to improve health and healthcare for everyone. So we could go back to the birth of our nation to an origin story forever linked to the subjugation and torture of enslaved persons for over 200 years, the perpetuation and the legalization of segregation with Jim Crow, or the wide sweeping attempts at voter suppression across the country more recently. This is a complex history, but one that is pivotal that we understand. I encourage those of you listening today to spend some time to learn a little bit more than what we have time to cover this afternoon. But for today, let's shine a small spotlight on the United States in the 1930s. So these are two maps. Um, on your right, this is a map of Brooklyn, and on your left, this is a map of Manhattan. So in the wake of the Great Depression, and as part of the New Deal, the homeowner's loan corporation developed a neighborhood ranking system. Green areas theoretically posed minimal risk to lenders and real estate developers. And this is where investment was, quote unquote, told that, that you would be, you would get return on your investment in these areas of the city. Red areas, which were more likely to be home to immigrants and of, quote unquote, undesirable populations. These were areas in which surveyors frequently took note in the original notes, which I have seen, of the quote unquote infiltration of black and brown communities and families. And they were considered hazardous or redlined for investment. Federal backing was then given to mortgages based on these grades and many banks simply refused to give loans to families, many families of color that lived in red areas. And as we know today, home ownership is directly correlated with the creation and sustainability of wealth. We also know that this is linked to both short and long-term health outcomes. Although this classification system ended in the late 60s, 
with the Fair Housing Act. Echoes of this discriminatory practice are still evident today. Bank loan denials, predatory mortgage rates, deflated home appraisals, and the list goes on. But this is unfortunately more than just home loans. If you look at any major city, Detroit, Chicago, Atlanta, Los Angeles, formerly red-lined areas are more likely to contain food deserts where you don't have an abundance of healthy food options, food swamps where there's an overabundance of unhealthy food options. These areas are less likely to have schools, less likely to have green spaces or healthcare facilities. And remember, these are the social determinants of our health. And the people that live in these areas are more likely to be black and brown. It is through this lens that we look at the racial and ethnic health inequities that we see today. They have not occurred overnight. They are the product of years of disinvestment and discrimination. They are the cumulative effect of systemic racism on the social determinants of health. So I want to bring you back to the map that I started with. So this again is a map of life expectancy in New York City. This was in 2018. And I wanna just have you compare, this is the redlining map from 90 years ago. I'm sure you can see some of the similarities in where areas that were formerly redlined are now areas where life expectancy is much lower. This is the history that we see in our communities today. We must be informed by this history. We must understand this system. We have to find the top of the fence before we can try to correct it. So in full disclosure, my history of redlining was quite brief and really only partially complete. But if I at all piqued your interest in this topic, you can go to segregatedbydesign.com for a short visual history of redlining in the United States, read Rothstein's The Color of Law, a forgotten history of how our government segregated America, or another really fascinating history of public disinvestment is included in Heather McGee's new book, The Sum of Us, what racism costs everyone and how we can prosper together. So yes, I am a doctor working in a large healthcare system and I'm talking about the Federal Housing Administration. How can this really be related to the work that I do? Well, let me come back to the founding mission of the Dalio Center for just a moment. We want to be a leader in the identification and elimination of health, not just health care inequities. And we want to focus on the systemic and the structural factors that create the conditions of our health. Of course, we focus much and probably most of our work on health care, but we cannot act in a vacuum. And we have to develop the partnerships and networks necessary to help pull those levers that I've shown you, pull the levers of the other social determinants of health to reach our goals, which is to help our patients and communities achieve their optimal health. So when we first started the Dalio Center, we divided our work into four key areas, data, education, research, and clinical and community strategy. And our work in those areas is quite broad. It ranges from the development of large scale clinical programs to improve access to solid organ transplantation, um, work in sickle cell disease, which has long been an underfunded disease across the United States, the development of a grants program to help support faculty research and health disparities, and recently, the support of a mobile medical unit to improve access to HIV and hepatitis C testing and education in communities of high disparity. 
Our most recent grant was actually to help develop an early childhood collaborative in northern Manhattan because we wanted to understand what are the needs in our communities post-COVID. But when we first began, we made the decision that a lot of our work, our long-term projects, the programs that we knew would take years of investment would be focused in women's and children's health. As cornerstones, and in many cases, the decision makers when it comes to the well being of the family, we knew that focusing on women's health may have the added benefit or the halo effect of including other family members as well. We know that there are dramatic differences in birth outcomes for women of color maternal morbidity and mortality, access to prenatal care, low birth weight and infant mortality rates have a clear and widening racial gap, one that we must all work to close. In New York State, Black women are three times more likely to, to die compared to white women. And in New York City, those gaps widen even further to a staggering eight times more likely. It's in response to persistent and frightening statistics like this that New York State launched work with healthcare systems across the state to improve birth equity, to focus on the maternal experience. It's why severe maternal mortality review committees have been instituted across the state and plans like the new family home visits program in New York City with expanded mental health supports and access to services like doula services have been funded. This is a program which former health commissioner, Dr. David A. Chachki, said it will offer critical support to underserved families and help reduce the persistent inequities in maternal and infant health in our city. As we learn more about early childhood development and the first 1,000 days of life, we know that the formative years through the development of adverse childhood experiences have long lasting outcomes. It's one of the reasons why I showed the map of childhood poverty. It is critical that we understand how our communities live. It's critical that we understand how this influences their health and well being for decades to come. A study in the 90s by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente, which is a healthcare system in California, this literature has subsequently been greatly expanded upon, but it showed a graded dose response relationship between the number of adverse childhood experiences and overall negative health outcomes later in life. So things that happened before children were in their teenage years influenced whether or not they developed cancer, diabetes, anxiety, depression. Early intervention is key to prevention. So we have to work to create a system that starts kids off without the fences. So what is it that we can really do? Well, forums like this one are important because they help us to recognize that moving the needle in any one of these areas not only requires commitment, passion, innovation, funding, but collaboration. This is work that we all must do together. Now for us, this work is both within the walls of the healthcare system within the communities that we serve and the linkages between those two. It's helping to increase access to healthcare, the healthcare system for prenatal care. It's ensuring that the care that women receive is unbiased and of highest quality. It's screening patients for their social and economic needs and then connecting them with the appropriate services to help address. So, about six months ago, we embarked on an extensive review of the literature. We met with various leaders across the health and healthcare space, and we listened a lot. We wanted to understand what potential interventions could look like for women and kids, 
particularly for women and children of color. We're currently focused on a small neighborhood in one of our communities of highest need. And keeping in mind this framework, the social determinants of health, and the wealth of work that existed across our system, our hospital system already, we actually started with about 15 different ideas. We thought about mold abatement in low income housing to help improve asthma rates, to could we develop an urban farm and commercial kitchen as both a source of employment and then to impact childhood obesity rates. We recently toured a former school space and we thought, what would this look like as a mom and baby hub? But of the many things we learned while doing this work, one of the most important has been the role and the necessity of community engagement. This is not work that is done to communities. It is done with communities. They must be the architects. We can fund the bricks and the mortar, but they must own the design and it must be of their own creation. So we've equipped ourselves with a number of ideas, a strong understanding of the local history. We actually brought in three historians to talk to us about the history of New York City and of Brooklyn to understand the history of slavery in Brooklyn and in New York City and state. So we wanted to know about the rich history of New York. We wanted to make sure that we had everyone at the table. And then we took a step back and we engaged and we planned a little bit more slowly. Listen, we are trying to solve some of the biggest challenges of health and healthcare today. We need a steady foundation and a well-defined strategy. I know there will not be any quick fixes or easy solutions. After 400 years of discrimination and of disinvestment, we know we have to take this slowly. So Dr. David Williams at Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health studies and talks extensively about the development of communities of opportunity. He notes that we can create communities of opportunity to minimize, neutralize, and dismantle the systems of racism that create inequities in health. Some of his solutions include investing more heavily in early childhood interventions and working to reduce childhood poverty. But he also highlights the importance of awareness, political will, and empathy. Cities across the country have declared racism as a public health crisis, and more are becoming aware of the striking differences in health. The Biden administration pledged to pursue a comprehensive approach to advancing equity for all, including people of color and others who have been historically underserved, marginalized, and adversely effective, affected by persistent poverty and inequality. From our quick study of the 1930s Federal Housing Authority, we know how imperative federal policy is to the pursuit of equity. But how do we build empathy? Well, we also spent some time recently with Dr. Mindy Fulalev. She's a social psychiatrist, the founder of the University of Orange, and author of Root Shock how tearing up city neighborhoods hurts America and what we can do about it. We learned a lot from Mindy and her team. She made us think about the social framework and the networks in new and exciting ways. In her book, she posits that forced urban renewal or the displacement of largely black and brown neighborhoods across America uproots communities, tears and breaks the social bonds and frays the social safety net, which leads to poorer and poorer health outcomes. She argues for a focus on the work that helps to re-knit the social fabric, bringing people together in a common unified purpose, bridging the gaps together, building empathy for each other. But again, we keep coming back to the complex influence of the social determinants of health. So, 
armed with all of this new way of thinking about our work in the Dalio Center, but again, wanting to focus on women's and children's health, we started, as I mentioned, by listening. In an event called Community Conversations, we are listening to new mothers during COVID, hearing from them about their experiences, the potential isolation, the fear and the joy of new motherhood during a once in a lifetime pandemic. We're honored to be working with the Caribbean Women's Association, the YMCA, the Brooklyn Children's Museum and CAMBA, which are partners with us in this work. We want to elevate the voices of black and brown women across the city. It's through this listening event, an event that Mindy would call a collective recovery, an event which we are hosting in the spring that we're collaborating with our community, bringing people together to listen to the common voice. We ask the questions, invite them to share, and then actively listen to the response. This allows us to build the work together. And we can solve these issues. In his research, Dr. Williams highlights the success of purpose-built communities. Communities in which specific and directed social investment in opportunity, educational, financial, environmental opportunity, led to the closure of some of the most persistent racial and ethnic disparities that we see today. It's the creation of opportunity, just like you are doing here with the development of FIT's Social Justice Center, building that sustained support network to address early education, mentorship, and training to provide professional support. You are building opportunity within a creative industry, which helps to shape representation in print media, in design, in fashion, it's who we see and how they are portrayed. Representation in all industries matters. And thankfully, we are seeing a groundswell. In the past year, enrollment by Black medical students is up by about 21%. Now, as someone who has frequently been the only Black physician in the room, I am overjoyed by these positive statistics. Diversity in medicine is imperative. Studies show that better patient outcomes, sh show better patient outcomes when they are cared for by more diverse teams. As noted in CHEST, which is a, a medical journal in 2018, physicians from racial and ethnic backgrounds typically underrepresented in medicine are significantly more likely to practice primary care they're more likely to practice in impoverished and medically underserved areas. Race concordance between patient and physicians results in longer visits, in increased patient satisfaction, and language concordance is positively associated with adherence to treatment among certain groups. We must see the change in order to create the change. Yesterday was actually National Black Women's Physicians Day. February 8th was the birthday of Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler, the first Black woman to graduate from a U.S. medical school in 1864. We need more Dr. Crumplers. We need more Kizamikia Corbett's in the world. So a colleague recently asked me, are you doing anything to address Black maternal mortality or early childhood development? Then I didn't answer with the lengthy explanation I gave here about the social determinants of health framework that we ascribe to in the Dalio Center. I definitely did not take a walk through 1930s history and the Federal Housing Administration or even talk about the extensive work that New York Presbyterian already does to expand access, improve the birthing experience throughout, through the use of doula services, or the enterprise work underway to improve birth equity. I didn't even talk about the community partnerships and collaborations already underway. I simply paused and said, we're working on it, because we are. We will get there. We're too driven too passionate and too committed not to. 
But, you know, as I was reflecting on this talk, thinking about Black History Month and the birth and the birthday of Frederick Douglass, I was reminded of one of my father's favorite quotes. In his book, The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, he closes his autobiography with the words, truth is patient and time is just. And while I definitely agree, I also remembered that my father loved Baldwin, who reflected when addressing racism in the United States, what is it you want me to reckon myself to? You always told me it takes time. It's taken my father's time, my mother's time, my uncle's time, my brother's and my sister's time. How much time do you want for your progress? So let us raise our truths together. Now is the time for justice. Let's knock down some of those fences together. Thank you. Wow, I just, I, I speak for everyone to say, thank you for such powerful remarks and tying everything together. So, I mean, a lot of times people look at things and um, separately, but they don't appreciate the connectiveness of these things. And you really brought it home. And I, I, I appreciate that. And I do have, we have a few minutes, but I, I really wanna ask one question. And I, I think it's, um, you, you mentioned something about community conversations. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, that's something we, we do here in terms of just get a feel. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. So, um, you know, Mindy Fullalove, who uh, I'm really privileged to have gotten to spend some time with her, uh, she really talks a lot about how do we bridge sort of segregated cities. So I showed a lot of maps about the way in which our cities are designed and how we actually live in quite segregated urban environments. Well, how do we bridge across those neighborhoods? How do we bring people together, build empathy, build a common voice? How do we start to kind of re-knit the social frameworks support our social safety net. Well, part of that is through events that really highlight conversation. And we wanted to listen to our community, but we wanted to give people a forum to speak and to say what they needed to. The past few years has been challenging by any stretch of the imagination. And we wanted to understand what are people feeling and get a, an understanding of where to start from. So this event called Community Conversations is really the story of um, a number of women who gave birth during COVID. It's to hear from them about the experience, um, hear from them some of the, the joys, as I mentioned, some of the heartache, some of the sense of isolation. And it's our goal and our first step at kind of bridging some of the conversation space. So. We are actually filming these women, um, and then we'll be having a screening event in the spring at the Brooklyn Museum, bringing in the community, bringing in our new moms, bringing in our community partners, bringing in kids, so that we can really start to host a, a recovery event. And we can hear from people, see people, and hopefully hug a few people. I, I agree with that. We look forward to seeing that. And one of the things I like to say to, when we bring people, I guess, to the FIT community is that we hope that you'll become a part of our community as well. And I, I think everyone here, I agree with the, I think everyone agrees with me that it was informative. Um, you are also a hero in what you do and should be appreciated. And, and I, and I know that I appreciate you and I appreciate now the, the friendship that we have developed as well. So, um, Dr. Ilya, uh, Ilya, sir, I, I get the name wrong all the time. So please. Yashira. 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 Um, Julia, thank you so much for being with us today. And I want to thank everyone in the audience for coming. And I also like to thank Dr. Brown for also being here with us and, and supporting us with, with the Social Justice Center and, and how you brought that 
Um, it's all connected. Everything all connected. that we do is connected. Uh, the social justice center and what you're in your health justice center. Right? And they have to be connected. I think that's one of the points um, I'd love to make to your audience today is that uh, when I say that representation matters, it does in every industry. We have to support people to pers- not only pursue their dreams, but really think about how do we visually see the representation of black and brown people across the country? How do we influence what that looks like? Well, it's by being at the table. It's by ensuring that we have a voice at the table. And it's actually, you know, I the, I know you started with the national anthem from the Balm and Gilead. I actually gave, um, a, a, I was on a panel with them not too long ago. Um, and it was, the, the title of it was Demanding a Seat at the Table. And I think that is what we all must do is we have to demand a seat, not at just the healthcare table, not at just the, the you know, the in, in any creative industry table, but at every single table we must be represented. So I hope that all of you here today understand the connection of every industry and how we're all part of this to really make differences in overall health outcomes. And, and you know what Shirley Chisholm once said, and said, if they can't give us a seat at the table, we'll bring our own chair. Um, <laughs> you and I can bring chairs together. We'll, we'll, I'll be sitting chair. next to you. <laughs> <laughs> Again, thank you so very much for um, being a part of our, um, you know, our awareness, but our celebration of, of Black history and of, of ways to make change. So thank you. And you are always welcome to our FIT family and our community. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.